So turning to tonight, we're so excited to welcome back Isabel Gournay and Mary Corbin Sees, both Greenbelt Scholars and Residents and often Greenbelt, Greenbelt Museum Volunteers, for which we're grateful. Um, they, along with Robert Freestone, edited the book, Iconic Planned Communities and the Challenge of Change. Um, they wrote a chapter in the book that's called uh, Greenbelt Sustaining New Deal Legacy, and then Isabel Gournay also has a chapter uh, that she wrote called Iconicity in Planned Communities, the Power of Visual, of Visual Representation. Um, Mary Corbin Sees is an associate professor in the Department of American Studies, University of Maryland College Park. She is the director of undergraduate studies in the department and co-director of the Material Culture, Visual Culture Working Group. And uh, she's also part of the Cultural Landscapes Working Group. Um, I see what I have. Um, Isabel Gournay is a native of France, and she's headed there very soon, right? <laughs> so, for another extended visit, but she's coming back. Um, and she also lives in historic Greenbelt. Uh, she's a college, University of Maryland College Park Professor Emerita, um, and she attended the Beaux Arts uh, and has a doctorate. Sorry, I skipped something. Uh, has a doctorate in art history from Yale. Um, many of her publications explore connections between architecture, urban design, and housing in France and the United States. So please join me in welcoming them. Hi, everybody. Uh, hi. Hello. How's everyone doing? So uh, I want to be sure to thank uh, Megan and the Greenbelt Museum for inviting us, to all of you for coming out. Um, I also want to start by acknowledging that there's a third editor to this book. His name is Robert Freestone, and he, is, he teaches at the University of New South Wales in Australia, and he's not here. Um, but it was actually Rob who had the idea to do the book. He did a session, uh, gosh, what was that, 2008, the International Plan and History Society, where we first pre presented some information on Greenbelt, and there were other people talking about other iconic planning communities. And after the session, Ralph said, you know, you really should do a book. And so we brought him in as an editor and recruited other people, and that was how the book came about. So, um, the way we've organized this talk is that I'm going to begin with an overview um, of what we did, how we did it, and a brief introduction to what we learned. And then I'm going to turn things over to Isabel, and Isabel is going to drill down into some of the challenges of change that our case study authors write about, as well as some of the ways that communities and their stakeholders have responded to these challenges. <coughs> And then I'll get to say a last word about how we're hoping people will use this book. Um, here and there, we're going to try to um, point out how Greenbelt compares to other famous iconic communities around the globe. And we hope to engage you um, when, with some questions and observations about how resilient Greenbelt is and how well it's doing in preserving its legacy um, and also providing a livable community after we finish our work. <coughs> So, we have a kind of elevator <coughs> speech version of what our book is all about, and it goes like this. What happens to iconic planned communities once their glory days are over? How have they navigated the inevitable challenges of growth and development, economic changes, and dem demographic shifts? <coughs> our book offers the first um, thoroughgoing attempt to address these questions by presenting um, 19 case studies that examine the challenges an international and relatively diverse set of iconic planet, planned communities face in the decades following their initial heydays. So um, we're featuring a quotation by Carl Feist. Um, Feist was an urban planner and a pioneer in the preservation movement. And this quote is from 79 years ago. And it was Carl Feist who turned preservationist attention for entire planned communities rather than individual buildings. When he lamented that, quote, few of those communities designed and built as complete units have come down to us unmutilated, end of quote. His comments underscore that iconic planned communities and the challenge of change is a book about preservation, but historically, 
few jurisdictions have created effective mechanisms for preserving the key features of the master planning of an entire community. So one of our important operating principles is that stakeholders need to embrace the entire package of community considerations. And that is a daunting list and a daunting task. It includes site planning, ecosystem, infrastructure, housing and landscape design, public spaces, community engagement, governance, transportation connections, responsiveness to demographic diversity, power relations, political economy, access to services, and local culture all together. So how can anybody consider all of those things together? But that's what we asked our authors to try to do. And everybody has done it in their particular way. So we're trying to fill that gap that Carl Feist noted um, by asking our authors to look at their iconic planned communities as holistically as possible. So before we get too far into our talk, um, since you know I'm a university professor and Isabel is a retired <coughs> university professor, I'm going to give her a pop quiz. And um, Isabel is going to pass that around. <laughs> okay, so um, shout out how many you don't know. Uh, uh, 22. <laughs> 22. We have 23 communities. So I think you were first at the 20, 22. Yes. Okay, so the prize goes here. Oh, no, we're here. No, no. The back of us, yeah. So we have the prize. I have 13. 14? Wow, 13. Nobody has more than 14? No, I mean, she has to not everybody, everybody actually, but that's what he has, he knows. Yeah, okay, well, we're still on not now. Okay, nothing. Anybody have more than 15 that you're familiar with? <laughs> I've seen 11. Isabel's seen a few more. Yeah. Okay, so how many? What's the biggest number we got of communities you've actually seen? 13? Oh, six. Yeah, I six. Six. Four. 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 Greenbelt, of course, was publicly sponsored. Um, <coughs> so, 
cultural <coughs> assets, densities, proximity to metropolitan centers, housing styles, affordability, governance, and design philosophies. So collectively, they illustrate an instructive set of preservation challenges, responses, and outcomes. Our communities span from the late 18th century to the late 20th century, and the bookends are New Lanark um, in Scotland, a company town, a mill town, <coughs> which uh, was initiated in the 1780s by David Dale and later uh, Robert Owen, and Seaside, <coughs> which you see at the bottom, a small golf-side resort town on the floor of Panhandle, initiated in the 1980s by Robert Davis, the developer, and the planners, Andre Swanee and Elizabeth Plater Cyber. Some Greenbelders may recall that Andre Swanee was here in Greenbelt and did a charrette for what we should do to uh, uh, develop then uh, Spring Hill Lake, now Franklin Park. Um, and so you may have encountered him. So now we're not saying that our selection includes the only or the best set of iconic planned communities or community types. We couldn't include every important planned community in this collection, but we tried to curate an assemblage that would inspire people who care about complex and visionary planning to think about how best to preserve the spirit and what is of practical value for current residents in their uh, community plans and ideals. Many of us, um, whether scholars, planners, or tourists, often first encounter these places through their iconic imagery. The artfully rendered plan of plans of Riverside, Illinois by Olmsted Rocks and Company, and uh, Well and Garden City by Louis de Soissons, which you see on the right. They were powerful and resonant representations, very widely published and disseminated when they first came out. <coughs> We have a chapter entitled Iconicity in Planned Communities, the Power of Visual Representation. <coughs> and in that chapter, Isabel defines and analyzes these highly recognizable images that encapsulate the visual specificity, but also the physical and social ideas behind these iconic planned communities. The aesthetics, aesthetics are often a key part of what and how we come to know about these places then they can also present them sometimes as idealized <coughs> and frozen in time. What we were going for was an analysis of these communities today as messier inhabited places. What has happened to them since their glory days? Not what we know from <coughs> studying them, but how residents and stakeholders experience them on the ground. And we ask our authors to assess the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, classic SWOT analysis, um, that their case studies are experiencing. And they were able to do so pretty well because many are residents, neighbors, or have studied these planned communities and visited them um, for years. Their chapters bring readers up to date about how these carefully designed places have changed, sustained, and survived despite burgeoning development, damaging economic decline in some places, evolving social relations, and of course, just the changes that occur with the passage of time. So our key contribution in this book is to inspire residents and stakeholders to assess these places created by planning from the past as they're lived today. So when we began the book project, we gave our authors a common set of questions to facilitate their thinking about the comparative assets and challenges iconic planned communities are facing. Because our case studies are located on six continents, we asked authors to pay special attention to the regulatory environments in each location for managing heritage-related growth and change. How readily and with what kinds of adaptations could strategies that worked in one community be used in others? These are work questions. What can we learn by comparing and contrasting the strategies that stakeholders are or could be forging to deal with those places and with those um, challenges? What has and has not worked to sustain iconic planned communities around the world? To make the comparative assessment easier to grasp, Isabel drafted, and I worked with authors to revise, a set of summary tables 
that address a chronology of the most important events related to the conservation and legacy of each community. And we hope these summaries will help readers identify case studies containing issues or circumstances similar to those in the planned communities that they have an interest in. The tables are embedded in each case study chapter. If there's more than one community talked about in the chapter, there's a table for each. <coughs> and the one you see here is for Den and Shofu in Japan. As our authors grappled with how to conserve the special qualities of physical and social planning in a way that um, serves the changing circumstances of the people who live in these iconic planned communities now, the three editors struggled to make sense of what we learned. We coded the case studies to determine the most prevalent patterns and differences emerging from our contributors' assessments. And we see the most <coughs> prevalent patterns here on the screen. So this is a summary of some of the key challenges of change that surfaced in multiple communities. And then um, Isabel, in a moment, will look at specific case studies and provide more detail about some of these. To help us think about the opportunities and strategies for preserving and strengthening iconic planned communities, we adapted a concept um, developed by planning historian Larry Vale. He calls it critical resilience. And our definition focused on the capacity of a community to change and adapt in order to maintain signature planning features and therefore the community's identity. <coughs> All of our, the challenges that our contributors <coughs> identified in the communities trouble the capacity. If you read the resilience literature, though, preservation and heritage are hardly ever mentioned. But we are arguing that protecting planning heritage promotes resilience by contributing to cultural identity, social co cohesion, stakeholder sense of place, and in some communities, economic vitality, as long as the original planning features continue uh, to enhance livability and the needs and well-being of today's community members. So this is an asset-based approach to community planning. The strongest asset that emerged when we coded our case study chapters is their distinctive planning legacy, environmental, and social. People found that these uh, amenities and design features still resonate today in many communities. Uh, they provide tangible experiences and amenities and enhance the quality of everyday life for a range of residents. Political and economic agendas and social ideas were <coughs> plans for many of these iconic planned communities, including Greenville. The people who study or care about iconic planned communities are usually most familiar with the Garden City ideas coming out of Britain. Some of you may, member, may remember <coughs> Greenville celebrated, celebrated its 75th um, anniversary in 2012. The Garden City scholar Mervyn Miller lectured about Greenbelt's relationship to the British uh, Garden Cities and its importance in that succession. But some of our case studies are quite different, such as Sabaudia outside of Rome and Karzani, <coughs> a company town for the Bada shoe factories in Slovakia. They were aspired, um, they aspired to different regional and local political economies for workers in both cases. High quality residential architecture and amenities comprise another important asset, especially where it has remained affordable over a long stretch of time, as in Garbatella, which you see here. And I think in the context of the DMV, we can still say Greenville. <coughs> to somebody who grew up where I grew up in Michigan, rural, close to rural Michigan, this would not seem very affordable. Since the majority of our case studies are inspired in some way by the Garden City idea, we asked how successful these communities were in sustaining their physical planning features. Greenbelt, we would argue, is one of the most successful in sustaining its original architectural and landscape design. But doing that is not a given in our case studies. In Den and Shofu, um, the house on the upper left that you see was the only remaining original European-style house from this Japanese garden suburb, 
It was built in the 1910s. In Japan, there's cultural value in landscape and economic value in land, but not in dwellings. When the land sells, the buyers tear down the previous house, as you can see in the lower um, uh, photo, and they build what they want. But even in high-end communities like Den and Shofu, builders don't, uh, buyers don't really build houses that they imagine as permanent, like we think of, you know, that might succeed to different generations of the family. Instead, um, the affluent residents of this place invest their money and effort in sustaining their distinctive lush green streetscapes and gardens. And they're quite fantastic, as you see in the slide, upper slide on the right. <coughs> Some garden cities raise the question of at what point is a garden city no longer ideologically a garden city. The garden city idea provided good quality housing for every stratum of society. While Hampstead Garden Suburb, which you see here, maintains its built environment and planning by controlling its design features and density, its real estate values have risen to the stratosphere. An article this past fall in the Financial Times cheers the return of rising real estate values at Hampstead after the recession, but the result is that the middle and working class residents, the artisans, the single women for whom some of the original housing was built, have long since been completely priced out of this suburb. How many people know that Soweto, the southwest townships in Johannesburg, South Africa, were apartheid garden cities. Anybody know that? Yeah, one, good. I didn't know that, too. Um, Angel David Nielsen in his chapter records this history wherein white South African officials turned to the garden city design model to provide housing that was marketed to uplift black South Africans, but whose main purpose was to segregate and control them. This puts the garden city idea in a white supremacy framework. And so Nieves raises the question of whether and how these communities of matchbox houses, as they call them, should be preserved. Are they artifacts of settler colonialism or of resistance to apartheid by local residents? Because a lot of the uh, <coughs> uprisings came uprising from these communities. So I'm now going to turn things over to Isabel, and she'll give you a closer look at what we learned from our case studies about the challenges of change and the strategies people have developed to address them. All of our communities, even Soweto, in the eyes of its planners, carried a strong promise to give their residents a good life. Indeed, this term was a leitmotiv in post-war Finland, as clearly stated by Arnie Allenen, who wrote the Tachula chapter. And in fact, Greenbelt was an inspiration for Tachula planners. And I would argue that the pursuit of a healthy, congenial life represents one of the major incentives to live in Greenbelt. Until the 1970s, <coughs> political, economic, and ideological changes did not prevent Partizansky from thriving as a manufacturing center. Since becoming part of Slovakia in 1989, it has struggled to adapt to the new globalized economy. Factories were all privatized, and the municipality was barred from purchasing <coughs> them. <coughs> Most of them seem empty or house storage space. Ironically, the city's current logo, which you see on the right, is this shoe, which as a floral ornament marks a key junction in the origin plan, which you saw uh, before. Green Belt was conceived as a semi-rural residential community but we are all aware that economic development is essential for its survival. Small craft and service industries are performed in some homes, and we may need an incubator workspace type of place to expand uh, this beneficial trend. At the opposite end of the economy, change, we find the uplands in British Columbia 
where I saw by Larry McCann, municipal officials were slow to initiate a solution to what he called monster houses. <laughs> However, Larry remains hopeful that a lot by lot regulatory approach will help retain the residential park character sought by Homestead Rover. So I think the pictures are pretty self-explanatory and I guess that teardowns will not be an issue in Greenbelt for the foreseeable future. The contrast in scale between our iconic communities, which are often made of single family homes, and the neighboring districts can be a very challenging issue, even if these communities benefit from decent protections. And this is pretty uh, much evidenced here in Sao Paulo uh, for this uh, garden city community built actually by a British, uh, designed by a British planner. And for us in Green Belt, I guess we have uh, often that physical Green Belt which mitigates scale contrast between the old Green Belt and what we can call sprawling suburbia. But I, it's my feeling, I'm, I'm a member of a planning board for the city, so I, I'm very concerned with a lot of things happening here. And um, I feel that we should not shy away to evaluate where measured densification is beneficial for us and where it is detrimental. Sometimes improvement in the lives of residents can have a negative and even irreversible impact on original plans. And this is the case in Homerstadt, uh, Germany, near Frankfurt. Uh, and that's what uh, Susan uh, Henderson, our author, refers to the crippling impact on the coherence of the settlement which was caused by the U-Bahn, which is kind of a light rail, but purple line, um, which uh, was, um, uh, according to uh, Susan, and I quote again, dealt a final blow by the addition of the race four-lane highway in 1980. So the sensational <coughs> views you had from the housing to the school all have disappeared. Private um, <coughs> automobiles also raise a challenge especially uh, in the narrow winding street of European interwar communities, which were not designed with parallel parking in mind. Mm -hmm. And when I go to the pool at night and I drive along Parkway, I feel that um, we may be on the scope of a parking saturation ourselves. Um, when it passed in uh, private hands, Company and government-owned housing has sometimes been remodeled or expanded in not so sympathetic ways, including in our midst. How to reconcile heritage concerns with updated concepts <coughs> of good life is a key challenge for most of our communities. Iconicity itself is a double-edged word a theme I discussed in the chapter I wrote. For instance, the perfectly balanced shadows on the impeccable lawn, which you see on the right, the undisturbed sun worshiper, convey a view far too idealized of suicide gardens to serve as areas <coughs> guidelines for the current stewardship of its common areas, which you see at the bottom. And this is what uh, John Pitari discusses in our book. We are pretty lucky in Greenland <coughs> because our internal reserve spaces are in very good shape. And especially, I think, the policy of uh, jointly maintained uh, playgrounds has been very successful. Uh, but don't get us wrong, we are not advocating museum-like pristineness. Uh, we advocate appropriating original <coughs> devices, both user and heritage friendly. And we do not have no trouble accomplishing this in Greenland. Uh, we, we know how to do things on our own terms. Our authors have engaged in four discussions of heritage policies and of public documents, which are summarized in the 
tables and reference at the end of each chapter. And the award for didacticism goes to a chart which was prepared by our Australian colleagues, Robert Freestone and Christine Garneau, for their chapter on colonial light gardens. <coughs> I must say that Mary and I did not attempt to draw such a chart, as we were a bit daunted by the complex layers of stewardship in Greenland. Discussed as well are major public controversies. For instance, in 1910, a proposal for a commercially driven redesign of Sarbalia Central Square surfaced in the press with the apparent support of the municipality. As stated by our author, Jean-François Lejeune, the uproar that this aseptic project, which you see on the left, created among citizens and cultural groups was quite unexpected, and it led to implementing a respectful restoration. What Lejeune deems as the marginal improvement of Sarbadia's historic resources has led, for instance, to restoring the iconic post office, which you see on the right, um, to house municipal archives. As we all know, green bankers do not shy away from controversy. <laughs> uh, maybe we ought to pick up battles, however, such as the provision of affordable and aging in place housing and follow through to achieve that. Some of our authors have themselves been key actors in the advocacy and preservation process they analyze. As uh, you recall, Marvin Miller was the keynote speaker at our 75th anniversary symposium. His untiring work on behalf of British garden cities has yielded a significant success. On the other hand, changing leadership has entered my um, uh, colleague Alena Kubovas to um, try to showcase partisan scale in an uh, international arena. Here is a picture of a poster for a symposium she organized in France uh, to, um, to really address issues in partisans. Many policies and initiatives can help sustain planned communities. For instance, the adaptive reuse of workspaces, this is a particularly successful example in network. And the broadening also of heritage designation to buildings which post-date the so-called iconic phase of our communities. Nonetheless, the ultimate heritage designation as World Heritage Site is both a blessing and a curse. After an unsuccessful attempt in 1986, New Lenoir was inscribed in 2001. John Minery, our author, disentangles the complex and sometimes contradictory regulatory framework of this industrial site in private ownership, which needs constantly to be diversified to be sustainable, faces difficulties in providing the necessary infrastructure and still seeks to help us conserve the physical symbols of Robert Owen's ideas to reform workplace and education. I visited New Lenoir not that long ago, and the visit was in little cable cars in the middle of the factory, and the whole thing seemed to be a little bit too much of a... Uh, <coughs> they obviously have issues with the way they need to cater to their um, heritage and interpret it. So, the Cité Fruges by the world famous architect Le Corbusier was listed in 2016 after three attempts to, uh, to be listed on the World Heritage Chart. Mm. And uh, this is a very small community in a suburban town near Bordeaux. It's not you know, an easy um, scenario for a World Heritage Chart. So, the exacting management plan, which is mandated by UNESCO to keep the status of World Heritage Sites until organizing new cultural and tourism activities, closer monitoring of repairs and construction work undertaken by homeowners, and as you can see, they were very significant, uh, and uh, improving visitors' accommodations by transforming 
one of the houses into a visitor center. So uh, this is a daunting um, uh, enterprise for a small uh, uh, town. Uh, our author, Gilles Rago, pinpoints our such enhanced heritage status, and I quote him, which was spirited to a larger extent by academics like us, Parisian cultural bureaucrats and PESAC's elected officials, rather than presidents themselves, end quote, that um, has reinforced pre existing uh, divisions between among the only 110 presidents. And some really want to go back to a totally historically accurate restoration, including paint. And some would like to adapt original design to their current needs. So this is uh, a great dilemma. Mm -hmm. Tourism has become a contributing factor to Soweto's economy. Is it an inequality <coughs> or is it a cultural curse exhibiting inequity and exploitation? As stated by our author, Angel Nieves, and I quote, should the cultural apartheid planning be concerned <coughs> or should it be adapted and developed in some ways that more closely benefits those living there? Very difficult question. Stephen Hurt, who happened to be my former dean and lives in the University Park, <laughs> explains how Seaside has become a cultural magnet for Florida's panhandle and how developer Robert Davis has from the outset factored evolutionary change in, um, as, a, um, as an asset rather than a liability. You see here how the tiny post office, which is uh, remain a key social central presence, a little bit like the mother and child statue is in Greenbelt. Even as um, peripheral resort communities, which you see at the bottom on the right, uh, which were not built by the same developer, cottages around seaside, and uh, they uh, allow for good connectivity to enjoy the amenities of seaside. And I think in, along the same line, the rather organic growth pattern <coughs> of walkable residential neighborhoods around the central core of Greenbelt, in all Greenbelt, is definitely uh, a success, in my opinion. Written shows demographic and economic decline has been reversed. Thanks to the connectivity ensured by a new streetcar line, envisaged from day one by planner Barry Parker, easy access to central Manchester is finally a reality. It took a very long time. The horseshoe shaped um, perimeter, which Parker laid out as a green belt, melding his garden city into a rural landscape has been reconfigured as an employment zone near the airport uh, for high-end technology. This is actually an inspiring success story, and I think for us, especially since we need to pursue improvements in our public transit uh, uh, structure, uh, this is useful to know. Tapula, very important, community is on its way to meet the challenge of densification, which in this case is related to the arrival of metro, rapid transit. And it really has been able to strike a balance between change and restoration. Uh, and this is the kind of balance we obviously have to maintain in Greenbelt. Mary is back. <laughs> So, Isabel and I have lived in the historic core of Greenbelt for several years now, and while we know some of you may not consider us Greenbelters, and we certainly didn't grow up here, <laughs> we have had a lot of opportunities to observe Greenbelt's assets and challenges in a way only daily familiarity can provide. In comparison with our other case studies, we think that Greenbelt has done an effective job of sustaining its original <laughs> legacy. There's no highway going through the center. Um, there isn't dramatic change, as you just saw in some of the communities. And for us, the secret of Greenbelt's success 
has to do with its activist stewardship um, at grassroots, cooperative, and municipal levels. Several important stewards are organizations. The Greenbelt News Review has diligently covered city and regional issues, important to Greenbelt's unique heritage, and sounded the alarm when there are threats or opportunities. But we're also thinking of GHI, the Greenbelt Museum, the old Greenbelt Theater, as well as the grassroots efforts that strive to make Roosevelt Center thrive. Citizens in Greenbelt continue a now decades-long habit of organizing themselves to improve the community, whether that involves serving on an advisory board, like the 75th Anniversary Committee, which you see here, proposing and developing one of the best farmers markets in our region, turning the New Deal Cafe into a premier live music venue, or organizing annual home or garden tours that help residents appreciate the community they live in. We count the city of Greenbelt as a vital steward as well for buying back key parts of our original Greenbelt, administering a vital set of recreational opportunities and amenities over a long period of time, purchasing the Greenbelt Theater building, and establishing a planity, uh, planning department decades ago, ago that has grown to become an important force in keeping Greenbelt's planning ideas alive and helping to incorporate them at least partially into new development as it occurs. Inspired by what we see in Greenbelt, we argue that both top-down, that is planned, and bottom-up, grassroots community <coughs> issues, must contribute in some kind of a dynamic combination to achieve ongoing livability and resilience, optimally. While none of the organizations or institutions we've mentioned is perfect, Together with an active citizenry, they form and have formed over time an effective and activist network advocate, advocating to honor Greenbelt's planning history, but also to adapt and innovate to keep things livable for people who reside in Greenbelt today. This kind of network stewardship occurs in some of our case study communities, but it's not something many iconic planned communities can count on. We conceived this book to begin an international conversation on whether to conserve these iconic planned communities as they evolve through time, and how to preserve the spirit and practical value of the often more diverse uh, uh, of their innovative built environments so that they enhance the lives of the often more diverse residents that live there now. Our goal is to encourage comparative analysis and cross-fertilization of the strategies that communities have deployed to make their planning legacies responsive to dynamic and rapidly changing societies. Building resilience in iconic planned communities is a process that happens in each context, where the devil is definitely in the details, and no single formula can foster resilience and <coughs> successfully in every location. But we hope that readers, including residents and stakeholders, will build their knowledge about the key qualities, practices, and mechanisms that places deploy to achieve their own balance between preservation and change and think about what the result of that has been. We'd love to hear your ideas about how to do that or about how to do it better <coughs> than we have so far as we built. And I think we have some time for questions. So thank you for listening. Democracy was a very big thing in Europe, as well as the authoritarian regime like uh, Mussolini, although Garbatella was started before Mussolini. So, uh, and uh, World War I, um, devastation. Um, uh, so, uh, and then also because there was uh, in America the Region 10, RPA, um, uh, we have two communities from uh, the 20s by. Um, Henry White and um, Clarence Stein, and they were advisors, I mean, not undercover advisor for Greenbelt, 
So um, this, this is actually a very international movement because Barry Parker worked on network and then he went to, he was asked to design communities in Sao Paulo. So definitely you have to know it. And this is also the, the time where architecture is changing, uh, the modern movements so called, Le Corbusier, um, and housing becomes a, a very important um, field for architects um, uh, in, um, in Germany in particular. So municipalities are taking care of big housing problems like in Frankfurt. Excuse me. I know. Agreed. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 This, this is, this is kind of a related question, but um, but I'm also curious where the original idea of like a garden city came from in this whole movement. Like, was it? a reaction to the Industrial Revolution, or was it something mm -hmm. else? Yeah, I mean, uh, do you know the three magnets of uh, the, uh, the big garden city person is a better than a Howard uh, journalist, and uh, he really also wanted, he wanted small towns, 30,000, uh, I think it's the number, actually we are, Greenbelt is kind of a garden city in that matter or two, less, but the notion of satellite towns, uh, decentralization, green belt, but also industry in every uh, in every one of those governments. And you wanted agriculture. And cooperation. Cooperation was a gap. It didn't happen in many of them. Yeah. So, and also the, uh, the land, land owned <coughs> the yeah. so, so just as one quick follow up. Yeah. So some of these seem like they were, you know, designed to be within a me metropolitan area and some wanted to be a lot more rural. So what, so in that context, what dictated which direction planners would go, whether to make it kind of like a neighborhood or a suburb of a city versus going like really out in the country and developing the community there? Uh. Well, I mean, the Garden City idea um, definitely was to have some distance between the city and the location of the Garden City. And the idea was that the Garden City would be self-contained. It would have its own employment. It would have its own agriculture. It would have its open spaces. You would be able to get everything there in one place. As things worked out, that's harder. Um, but I think the history of suburbia and the suburban movement internationally comes in here, too. Um, suburbia, you know, this compromise between city and country, um, often idealized, often imagined um, as a place where more affluent people could live originally um, and control their community in a variety of ways, and including deciding who got to live there and who didn't get to live there. I think that was very attractive um, uh, in a lot of places. And so these places oftentimes go out on transportation lines. It could be highways, streetcars, train lines. And the municipality, the metropolitan area, grows up around them. So um, you know, when you look at that um, slide of Paca Embu um, with you know, this huge metro metropolis of Sao Paulo, you know, just engulfing it, that of course wasn't all there. It was lower scale and lower density and not nearly as well developed. And so part of this is also that how they look today, this is part of what we're talking about in our book, is not how they were originally conceptualized to be. But now they have to figure out how to deal with their current circumstances and the fact that, you know, um, uh, galloping densification is encro encroaching on many of these places. How do they, how do they, do they want to um, just give in to that? Um, in some places that makes a lot of sense because providing multifamily houses means that you can have more affordable housing. Um, do you want to hang on to what you've got and try to control your borders and um, fight every kind of change? These are the kinds of issues that a lot of these communities are working with. And then some of the communities also have lost their economic base. Yeah, yeah because for instance, uh, for this notion, I don't know if you know anything about the towns of Batia. It's, it's a fantastic the story. Where? Uh, Batia, the, the um, shoe manufacturer in Czechoslovakia, oh, okay. was on, had this major, in, in Zlin, 
which is still, and then it had all these satellite towns, but it built everywhere. There is Bata towns in India, in France, in England, even in near Baltimore, and unfortunately completely demolished. And so they, they created that notion also of, it was in rural spaces, but they were networks of trains and things feeding into production. So it's a, it's a fascinating you know, story. Thank you. Uh, Bridgewater County is going uh, through a very uh, significant rezoning plan. Uh, do you know of any uh, risk that is posed, you know, to Greenbelt in terms of preserving its original <coughs> historic architecture and landscaping and, and so on? Um, yes. Um, one of the things I discovered in the research for this chapter is that the old zoning um, designates old Greenbelt as um, a residential plan community, RPC zoning, and it has very strict um, restrictions on what can be done and what can be changed. Um, so, for instance, it, it, it is um, not permitted to build in the open spaces in the territory occupied by GHI. That's, you cannot increase the number of units. Increase either. the number of units either. Mm -hmm. um, so that's very, very strict um, control, and I hadn't realized that that control existed um, until I <coughs> interviewed um, our planner at the time, um, and um, she pulled out the maps and showed me, and we went over the rules and regulations. So that kind of zoning is going to go out and it's going to be replaced by something and the question is what's going to replace it? What we hear is that it's going to be another kind of zoning that recognizes um, the special nature of communities like Greenbelt and it's going to have a lot of control. But again, the devil is in the details and the details are being worked out. Um, I wasn't able to make the presentation in December. I don't know if people were here um, to hear how that's coming along. Um, that's like the middle of grading for University of Maryland people, so that's what I was doing. Um, but I think that we have to watch it really, really carefully. Um, you know, one of the things Green Builders have done a good job of historically um, is to rise up and protest when they see something happening at the county level that they think is going to not be good for um, our community. And so I think this bears watching very, very closely and maybe galvanizing a group of us to um, have our say if we don't like what we're seeing. So far it seems to me that, you know, there's a recognition that this is a special place and that there should be some kind of planning replacing the RPC zoning um, that affords a good deal of protection. But it's not final yet, so it's something we have to watch very carefully. Can I just make a quick follow-up comment? I was at that meeting in December, and uh, things are moving very quickly. And I think public input, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, is going to be uh, taken until April of yeah. this year. And then they're going to move forward <laughs> with finalizing uh, what kind of zoning we're going to have by, I think, the fall of this year. So, um, if there's any kind of galvanization, it has to happen now. Yeah, so go on the web and check it out. I mean, uh, there's one more little comment. Um, Isabel and I both do walking tours um, for the real estate um, development students, graduate students at the University of Maryland. And every time I've taken a group to Old Greenbelt, They've looked around and said, oh my god, this is ridiculous. Look at all the space you could build on. Oh, <laughs> you should have stuff here, you should have stuff here, you should have stuff here. So, you know, uh, there are people out there that are um, not advocating for the kind of zoning we're hoping we're going to get. Uh, so let me just say that. Good. What about um, the new zoning? How will that affect the area around Old Greenbelt? Will the community change the I think uh, there's also an issue with the uh, Roosevelt Center, which uh, may not be so well protected, from what I understand. If people, but, yes, if people want to see what will happen, you can go to the um, Prince George's County zoning um, map 
and you'll see yeah. what it is now, yeah. and you can click on it, and it will show you how it will be different. Mm -hmm. So then yeah, be it's see. very interactive, right? Yeah. So is I would this, really is suggest people do that. Is this on PG Atlas or a separate? Yeah. It's well, Se separate. Separate. Yeah. That's what they call the swipe tool. That meeting was recorded. It's on the same website. So if anybody wants to. to and it's a very active better. group working to protect them. I think the question is you can see it's going to change the zoning. What does it mean? I mean, like, okay, what's the problem with the Roosevelt Center? What, what could happen? Well, uh, <laughs> which was the 1968 plan? Yeah. Put a four-lane highway through it? Mm -hmm. so, uh, no, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean what, could, what, are the, what are the dangers in the, in the new plan? What could happen in Roosevelt Center if they go through the new plan? I think something could be the next to Roosevelt Center. Or, you know, they are, I don't remember exactly, but also the designation of the type, <coughs> the type of retail and things could, uh, what's allowable in the change. So what would be allowed? But anyway, we, we're in a constant, you know, it's uh, what's uh, it's, so many things happen around us. I mean, I'm Bedford Plaza, all these places. Uh, and the FBI going to come, the FBI going to come. Is there going to be a 25 story, you know, luxury condo behind like Site North? Every time we try to revise our conclusion, there were new issues, you know, and we, we, you know, we had the FBI and they were very prominently featured at the end of our chapter and then we had to take that out because that didn't seem to be, you know, a, a current threat. Um, but, you know, the, the, I guess the issue is vigilance, you know, you got to stay on top of things. You have time for about one more question and then I want to leave time for book signing. So we have to be out of this room by about 9.30, so just one more question if you could. <coughs> Yeah, I think it would be quick. But <laughs> uh, you, along the talk, you always refer to the Garden City. Um, you know, you talk about Greenfield communities. Yeah. But then I see the title is Iconic Planned Community. So is there any planned community who is not a Garden City? I mean, yes. I mean, like Partizetsky, uh, uh, my colleague, Alain, always call it an industrial city. Yeah, but you could it's still design it's it. It's a company it. town. You could still design yeah, it. You can it. design it as a garden city. I mean, the real garden city has a set of requirements, like uh, co um, cooperative ownership. Right. Uh, That's what I thought. But the, yeah. the question is, is the plan community larger than mm -hmm. the garden yes. city? Yes. Yeah. So, but most of the one you described were yeah. garden city. Yes, a plan community does not have to be a garden city. But garden cities oh, <laughs> tend to be more garden suburbs, like Hampstead yeah. Garden yeah. 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 Do you sell your shoes? <laughs> uh, I thought I'm in Paris. We might at the museum. <laughs> <laughs> I should say iconic freedom. Yeah, we might do that. Um, Almost. Thank you so much for staying.